good if you can give your name and sort of um, uh, just sort of give a, a, a short bio, bio of your uh, military and government and consulting career just okay. sort of, in, in sort of a resume sort of way just so we have a sense. Okay, my name is William John Pollock and I'm 56 years old. My background initially started in the Air Force in the mid-60s where I was a computer operations and programming specialist for first at Pope Air Force Base after training and then in Vietnam. The first event in my lifetime occurred then that woke me to a new paradigm. That paradigm was that late at night a young lady and I were in the woods in about 30 miles southeast of Fayetteville, North Carolina and had an unusual experience with a UFO at about 300 foot distance. The UFO prompted before it showed up to have all the frogs, the crickets, and all those noisemakers late at night shut off like a light switch. And it appeared 20, 30 seconds later and passed by us at about two, 300 feet on a line only 40, 50 feet away from us, heading from a southeast to a northwest direction about 11, 25 at night. After it disappeared over the northwest end of a small lake we were by, there was a continued period of silence for another 20 or 30 seconds and the frogs, crickets, and all the other noisemakers at night wound up turning back on like somebody again had thrown a light switch. That event was rather dramatic in my mind in that it prompted me to start questioning what was really going on in the world. This was a late night, clear night sighting up close and it could not be mistaken for a helicopter or any other plane that I was aware of that the Air Force had back in 66. From that point on, I went to Vietnam and spent a lovely year there in the tropical resort community of Nha Trang and got to meet a lot of nice people, particularly the Vietnamese. But in my work, we became very involved with processing and sending on to Washington intelligence data. This was in addition to our normal computer load of maintenance reports, payroll, etc. And in that situation, it became quickly evident that we could have fought this war at a much higher level and much more efficiently than it was intended. It became obvious to all of us that it was a political war and not to be won. After that experience, I left the military in spite of the fact that almost everybody in the computer science arena was asked to stay on. In fact, the Air Force encouraged us by promising us four-year college degrees, fully paid, officer's salary while we're in, etc. But none of us stayed. Several years later, I got back into using my computer knowledge when my first wife had passed away in 77, and I was asked to come and help get a firm to grow called Rusco Electronics. In the late 70s, Rusco Electronics was the largest manufacturer and installer of access control equipment in the world. A friend of mine had asked me to help him because he wanted to leave the company and start his own company. And I said, yeah, I'd love to. You know, my wife had just died and I was looking for something new to do. And it quickly became apparent that everybody in the security industry was back in the old relay days of philosophically and technologically, and that the, industri the industry did not have very many people with computer expertise. What it quickly occurred in just a year or two is I went from doing corporate level work in the Denver area, which at the time was growing like a mushroom, to doing military work, national work, and getting my, getting my security clearance back and activated again. This led to doing a lot of work for the State Department and eventually by 1980 realizing that the firm I was with was good, about ready to be left in the dust technologically. We tried internally to convince them to upgrade their technology and they would not. And I started my own firm with two other engineers in Denver, one from Hughes uh, who was based at the time at Buckley Air National Guard Base, which is actually a primary 
site for reception of uh, satellite, sat, uh, satellite data for national security purposes. And another friend at, uh, from Lockheed. Well, it was Lockheed Martin today, but it was Martin Marietta back in those days. We started the firm and developed within nine months the most powerful electronic security system at the, available at the time. In fact, we prided ourselves on having a form of Windows before Macintosh on our systems without any command codes. You just punch and click and move Windows around. And we did a lot of work. We, at one time, were doing 17, 18 major systems around the country. In fact, we did five alone for uh, Federal Express, and we'd link these systems into a war room type environment back at their headquarters in Memphis, at the time called the Pony Farm, through a satellite link. We were one of the first ones to link security sites, systems at separate sites, back through satellite linkages. We time multiplexed with their data going back and forth for their shipping. And this led to a lot of other projects. And eventually, even when that when I finally left that, my own firm that we helped start in 84, I started working for Beltway Bandit type consulting firms. This would be SIC, Tracor, EGMG, et cetera, either as a contractor for them or as an employee for a period of time. It was at this time, again, that I realized that there was something amiss during this period of time when I was developing security systems out of a national security interest, in addition to large corporate systems. And I needed to find a security system in this marketplace as something that is as complex as any web network today. And the systems would run from a half million to $25 million just for the hardware. The systems that we worked on were starting to be placed in areas that surprised me. There was one particular project when I was at EGNG where we were tasked for designing a system for a base that it amused me at the time, nobody seemed to be aware of in Nevada called Tonopah Base, east southeast of the little my, old mining town of Tonopah. And that this base was actually where the F 117s were kept when they went operational. They were never kept at Groom Lake, that was only for testing purposes. And that the entire wing was based there at the time. And our guys used to chuckle about the Ravel model not being quite right. And what concerned me was that at this time there was a, a decision that we had to make on what was going on at Tonopah and that there was a lot of facilities deep underground there that we secured. And there were elevators that would go up and down, very large elevators that could take craft, much like the uh, elevators on an aircraft carrier, but in, on a land-based environment and that these went very deep underground and that the equipment that we could see underground around was not that which would run a normal aircraft, generators, air conditioners, etc. There was a totally different type of equipment. Now, one of the things that interested me after I left that project several years later was that they finally announced the F-117. And one of the concerns I would have is what is being done with Tonopah now because they were moved in a rush, a very big rush. Now, if I remember the number right, there was $75 million spent in only a nine-month period to prepare Holloman for the F-117 teams. Now, that's okay, but why the rush to get them out of Tonopah? With some of the facilities that are deep underground becoming activated on a full-time basis, not just for testing purposes, and that they needed to remove those planes and those crews and support staff to Holloman and to prepare in a rather large rush for a new project to be brought in there. But none of the indications we had or my staff had that would actually install the security equipment had was, that it was like any other plane, even something as broad-ranging as the Aurora that we have all heard about in, to one degree or another. But I need to back up a bit. There is another subject I need to broach above and beyond the ufology subject that I got involved with that relates to this when we talk about alternative government control mechanisms. In that one of my favorite hobbies has always been tracking new technologies. And hopefully so it benefits in business. 
And in 79, work, living and working in Denver, I came across a company that if necessary, I can provide documents for that I've kept on file of a company in North Glen, Colorado, which is a northern suburb of Denver, was developing an implantable chip originally for horses because there was a major problem then and it may be still today of shilling of horses. You would have two horses that look alike and you would put the dog in and you'd bet against him when everybody thinks it's the fast one or you'd reverse that and bet against him. And he was attempting through good faith to develop a technology to give a unique signature to every single horse. That pill, if you want to call it that, intelligent pill, at the time was already small enough by then to implant under the skin with a horse needle, a large hypodermic needle. And I was shown these and they worked. And we could read them with a primitive hand wand type reader from about seven or eight feet away. And this was still primitive technology. <clears throat> Excuse me. Now, at the time in the security industry, a lot of us had a lot of concerns about tracking and locating people that had been kidnapped, particularly what was going on in Europe at the time where we were having NATO officers, even the Prime Minister of Italy, kidnapped. And these people were drained or they were brutalized or both. And one of the goals of the industry was to develop technology that would allow us to track these people or locate them quickly, hopefully to save their lives, but on a secondary basis to keep them from being drained of sensitive information. And I brought this technology to a meeting in a skiff room in Virginia that was arranged by a friend of mine with the CIA and another friend of mine with the State Department at the time to introduce this technology to what we felt at the time were the right parties to use this new technology responsibly. Now I hadn't heard about the remnant or any other religious beliefs at the time that said that everybody was going to be implanted with some sort of marking system, a uh, law of the beast or 666. I, didn't, I wasn't even aware of that stuff at the time. And I was taking this as a serious solution to a potentially problematic, a problem that would not go away. And it was interesting, we met in this room and because of the tight meetings we were involved with, certain people would not introduce their, give you their full name or where they came from. I just had to trust that my two contacts had contacted the right parties to be there at the right time and that they would all be responsible individuals. There was a mistake. After that meeting, I discovered that two of the people in the meeting had never been asked there, yet they knew about the meeting. They knew what it was about. They knew who was going to be there. And later research indicated that one of them actually worked for the Department of Agriculture and one of them worked for the Department of the Treasury. What prompted our looking at these two men was that the way they asked the questions, the questions they asked, the attitude behind them, even the body language, indicated that they had reasons for the use of this technology other than the one that was intended at the meeting. In fact, their largest concern was how fast could we make a couple billion of them? And could we each give each one of those a unique identity number? Now, this particular pill-shaped device, very minute, had a lot of flexibility in its capabilities. It was basically just a almost a transponder. You would send a frequency to it and it would respond back with its unique number which not, could not be changed once the chip was made. Yet there were a lot of capabilities that could be added to this chip, such as monitoring temperature, blood pressure, pulse, and even waveforms out of the brain. And, but that was for research down the road. What was amusing to me a few months ago on a website uh, that uh, likes to cre uh, collect articles on the unusual is that a lady out east had a chip removed from her body in uh, 1999. And they had it blown up on the website and it was a slight modification of this chip from Denver with some of its enhancements and it was put in her she believes in the, either 1980 or 1981. 
what was amusing about this was that this gentleman never had to worry about money again. And he quietly passed on a lot of this technology to somebody we never knew. And this concerned my contacts in Washington because it never went anywhere with them. Somebody else took it and ran with it, and we never knew who it was. Now, in 1984, I found another technology by just sniffing the web, sniffing the, the, the literature of our industry and a dozen other industries, and I found that there was a professor at the University of New South Wales, who, where I still have the files on, that had discovered a way to make a microscopic lithium niobate chip. And by accident, he had scratched it. And he had a um, RF transmitter there. And he had a receiver on by sheer chance. And he found that on a uh, certain frequency, he could send an energy beam to the chip. And it would respond back with a number. He worked on that technology. And that technology, eventually, I found out about. We flew him in to Denver to our company. System Group of Colorado, and we did a test. He had some primitive small chips he brought with him. They're totally passive and very small, a 32nd of an inch, and only a couple thousandths thick. And by etching them, you could again create a unique signature, unique to each one. And this one theoretically could, depending on the size of it and the size of the etching, could have a unique number in the billions and billions. In fact, the uh, test we did was amusing in that we <clears throat> set up a transmitter and a receiver based on removing a air grill from our drop ceiling and plugging up our transceiver into that as our antenna. And we were able to read that thing glued to a little piece of, ply of uh, cardboard from 100 feet away with a piece of grill out of a drop ceiling, which is a, a pretty primitive antenna. Because we didn't know what frequency it was dealing with, so we had to come up with some kind of instant generic antenna. We were so impressed with the capabilities of this, it would read through thin layers of material, like thin plywood. And we were so impressed that, again, I felt that this was a technology that truly had some value. Because we also discovered in some testing that papers, the papers work he had with him, that if we had a microscopic coil antenna with this, that we could read this from a mile away. And his later on analysis, a few weeks later, he got back to me and said that if we had an antenna, a coil antenna two inches in diameter with a chip in the middle, and that the, what the antenna is actually doing is acting as an amplifier to a great extent, and that what it sends back out is a harmonic of the original frequency that his numbers crunching showed that he could read this thing from 120 kilometers in space. And that there were other attributes of this chip that could be tied into it, especially if it was powered in some minute way, and give it a lot more kickapoo juice. Well, again, I took this, and a lot more care this time, to a meeting that we had in Virginia at a subcontractor's company that I knew that it does a lot of work for the intel community. This time I had the director of, the, of security for all of State Department there, and again, a good friend from CIA. Again, we had, at the last minute, people walk in the door with the right credentials, but we didn't know who they were exactly. It turns out, again, we had people, two this time again, who we, after the meeting, we realized shouldn't have been there. And yet they had credentials that were awesome. Because it turns out afterwards, I found out they had never been called by my two contacts. Yet they knew about our phone calls. They knew of exactly what time, what place, and what we were going to be talking about. And supposedly, my phone calls were made over secure phone lines. What concerned me more about this particular event was that I have in my records again the name at the time of the head of security at State Department. And I got to know him well because I designed the security system, at least a major portion of it, for Main State, or the headquarters in Foggy Bottom in D.C. And so he and I knew each other very well. And that one of the things that Bob wanted to do was before he retired, 
He wanted to have his family, particularly his two boys in high school, experience what it was like to live off out of the country. So he actually gave himself the job. He demoted himself to head of security for East Africa. And he, they, he and his family, shortly after this event, this meeting, moved to Kenya, to Nairobi. And he and I quietly kept in touch through our other contact in Washington. And kept probing who these two men were. We were having a devil of a time finding who they were, who they really were. Because uh, what bothered me was that the professor all of a sudden got a giant grant. The technology was transferred. He never had to work again the rest of his life. And a friend of mine in San Francisco, who I had quietly told about this technology, because he was involved with other aspects of national security and tracking people, he got a project to do a physical security system, access control, cameras, intrusion monitoring, everything that works, for a little company in Silicon Valley. And he said it was eerie to him, but what they were making there looked eerily like what I had described to him. He built the security system in this modern fab, building billions of these little chips. He wound up a year later being asked if he'd want to buy the security system back. They were shutting the factory down after they'd made billions and billions of these little chips. And it was a division of a rather major European electronics firm that had the plant. Siemens. Siemens. And what concerned me was that they had built these chips and who knows what happened to them. And they built them in the billions in volume because they're so small that you can take a six inch wafer and make hundreds of thousands of them on a wafer. And they disappeared somewhere. But in the process, what concerned me more was Bob did not give up trying to find out who these guys were and who they worked for, what their agendas were. He and I had had long talks of now by the mid 80s about what was really going on in government, who was controlling what, what concerns he had. Because he had come to the realization there were a lot of things going on that weren't right. And he had supposedly made some contacts to find out more of what was going on. And he had contacted our mutual friend at CIA, another con long-term contractor, been involved since World War II, in the very founding of the CIA, who got in touch with me and said, Bob's got something hot. And when he's back in the country again on business, we're going to get a meeting. A few days later, Bob was on his way to work just after dropping the two boys off at a private high school, I believe, in Nairobi. He was on the way to the embassy. And he was broadsided at a stoplight at 60 miles an hour by a reinforced Land Rover. He was killed instantly. The Brit that supposedly was drunk at 6 in the morning, 7 in the morning, was taken to the hospital and immediately disappears. And all the evidence he had given in the way of documentation was proven to be phony as to who he was and Bob was killed. And it was a hit. And it's always concerned me today that he had gotten a little too close to who had been involved with this implantable chip technology. We'd been trying to, for a couple of years then, quietly trying to find out who had been doing it without our government realizing it was going on. Because whoever it is has got total ability to penetrate anytime, anywhere, our government and locate what is going on instantly. Who do you think they are? Research since the early 80s on my own and with some friends indicates that we have at least four power groups in the world. They have wealth beyond all imagination. They have advanced technologies. They have taken over various programs, particularly black programs, within our government and probably even the Russian government and the Chinese. They're Politics to them, as we know it, is not the same. And they have agendas totally unlike what our governments, we perceive our government's agendas really are. And that they are able to track unbelievably what's going on around them at, at, at a minute level. And who these people are, we are, my friends and I have given them names, but they, they have no relevance uh, to what they recall themselves. We just simply call them the Four Horsemen. And that 
these horsemen work together in, at times, and they work against each other at times. There's an ongoing battle between them at a low level to who's going to be top dog in the world. The one commonality to all four appears to be an absolute desire for control of everything and everything. And that uh, they, some of them have different bases for this. From the point of view of it, each of them has their own philosophy. And that core root philosophy guides them, supposedly, in their actions. And we believe that this is what was causing a lot of strange things to happen in Nevada that we were experiencing, and, it, and in a, on a strange way, correlates also with what happened with these implantable chip technologies that I personally brought, now I look at it, to the wrong people in the government. Because we never got to use that technology for what it was we really intended it to be used for. What do you think, these two men who came to the meeting, what credentials did they show to get in? I mean, what, what did they have? Were they FBI or were they... Above and beyond that, they were NSA, NRO, that sort of credentials that we would later check and they didn't exist. They did not exist. Yet their credentials were spotless. Even to the point where if it was an access control requirement, the identification systems that they carried m passed all the access control mechanism requirements we had, be it biometric, be it fingerprint, be it eyeball, be it anything, even to access code numbers. They knew it all. They had it all. And it was better quality than actually what the agencies had, which is most enlightening. It means unlimited budgets. Do you think these were, in a sense, uh, privatized operations, uh, international corporate or institutional back entities? If they are, it's at a level way beyond any of the corporate security people I've ever worked with. And I've worked with all the major oil companies. I've worked with all the major computer companies on designing very high-end security systems. And none of the people in the commercial arena there ever gave me the least concern that they were involved with something above and beyond what their corporate requirements were or agendas were. Uh, they were truly corporate people. Now, if there are corporate people out there that are hiring private people outside the corporate chain of command to do specific functions, I would not have known about that. The one area that I will say that is strange, and that is the aerospace industry in this country, and that I did a lot of work for several of the aerospace companies, either in the way of physical design of systems or in the least consulting. And there were times when I came across people that seemed to know a lot more than they did. And they, some of them are very good at controlling their body language, but not perfectly. And we would run across various companies, particularly those in California and in the Denver area, that had projects ongoing that they were doing security work for that was beyond black. And I've been involved with those obliquely, so I can tell the difference. But certain comments were made over a long period of time, and you bring them all those comments together that on, on their face, one comment doesn't mean anything. But four or five or ten comments over a four or five year period start creating a storyline for you. And it, the storyline basically is that there's a lot of work going on in the aerospace industry that would re indicate that we have black projects that have gone even darker and that there's work being done on electrogravitic, on um, scalar technology, et cetera, that we don't even think that those in Congress or even in the military that approve black budgets are aware of. They've been taken offline. They're funded through some other mechanism other than, in one case, I know of one black project that got billions of extra money back in the 80s and I was quietly told that it never went over budget by more than a million. And there were billions of money funneled through that black project onto something else. And the gentleman admitted it to me. Which corporations? That was Northrop. That was Northrop at Plant 29. The 
But when you look at the scenario of the entire series of events, it starts forcing you to take your head out of the sandbox and put your sunglasses on at least so you can look at the bright sun and find out what reality is all about. And to a great extent, because of what I was involved with and the knowledge from 85 that the Cold War was going to wind down as we know it back then, it's just mutated into a new type of war, that I had to prepare to get myself plan to get myself out of the business because budgets by the late 80s we all assumed in the industry were going to start drying up and so during the late 80s I wound up just doing consulting work for SAIC, for Tracor, for ED, uh, uh, several of the Beltway Bandits and slowly got myself out of the business and got into the consumer arena and believe it or not, started a cable company in 89 in New Mexico. Tell me a little bit more about, you know, the way that you see the, uh, for example, these people that appeared at the meeting and people who work at that level. Uh, do you see them as being responsive to the president or the chain of command? Is the American public thinks of it? Talk about a little bit, if you can, about what you found about uh, how the game is really played and who's in the loop and, and in control and who isn't. Okay, Steve, you brought up a good question about who, what's the mentality, what's the attitude of these people that I would run into periodically that seem to be out of the loop. They're not in the chain of command. Their attitude is that they look, act, and taste like bureaucrats. And having been around them for 20-some years, they have their own unique flavor. But these people had agendas. They were unlike any agendas that you would ever have run into if you're in the mainstream government. Um, an example would be that in the early 80s we worked on a project for the Department of Agriculture uh, and the state of Maryland for a period of time to try and convince them to get away from food stamps and let's go to a credit card machine that's coupled to the cash register. That would be an ID card, a simple swipe card or some other high le higher level of access control card if needed. With a keypad, PIN number would be implanted onto the keypad so that the person could, only that person could get food off their food stamps because at the time, and I believe even today, there is a huge percentage of fraud perpetuated in the food stamp arena to the tune of billions a year. And so we got to meet an awful lot of guys at a high level in the Department of Agriculture that are in control of this program. And they are very familiar with access control equipment, particularly after we got done educating them. And the limitations and the capabilities of that technology to aid them in saving the public billions of dollars a year. That project went nowhere. The politics at the time were such that they didn't want to solve the problem. In fact, you wonder in the big cities where a lot of the members of various committees are from, if they weren't getting a kickback at times. But so we had a lot of interface with people in the Department of, of Agriculture, as an example. Yet the one we met at that meeting from the Department of Agriculture had a level of knowledge far beyond what these people had. And he had a different attitude. It was an attitude that was almost apolitical. And it was pure technical, and it was very cold. And the questions that would be asked was, how fast can you make them? How fast can you set up a factory to make them? How many can you make in a period of time? How reliable will they be? Are they erasable? Are there any negative aspects of them when they're implanted in the human body? Will the body reject them? Et cetera. These are questions that, interestingly enough, none of the bureaucrats ever asked. They assumed that we would have a contract to solve those problems or overcome them. What do you think is being done with these implants? I think they've been distributed. I have indications in the military that uh, a lot of our special forces units have been implanted over the last 10 years, if not longer now, and that there are other people that have implanted, such as I mentioned earlier, that we had that lady that had one removed because it was irritating her, and she had her surgeon remove it, and it turned out to be very similar to the technology from 1979 that I had brought to Washington out of Denver. How did she get it? Does she recall? Um, how did she? She doesn't remember. 
She doesn't remember. She remembers almost as in an alien abduction scenario. She misses, remembers vaguely some missing time back then. But I don't know the whole story of that. We could do some research on that, Steve, and uh, go back to that web posting and backtrack from there to who she is and to who her doctor was and find out more. Going back, you were talking about this uh, Tonopah facility. Yes. Uh, they moved the F-117s out. Um, what do you think uh, is there? What, what was being worked on and what, what's there? On well, we had a base that was very modern. We had a base that was literally state-of-the-art equipment, along mixed in with the old stuff, because the Air Force doesn't throw anything away if it doesn't have to. They know how to squib, uh, rub nickels together. They've had to. But the importance of that base can never be minimized. It is very remote. It is between the two low mountain ranges. So from a land-based positioning, you cannot see into it. Actually, it's more remote than, until recently than um, what was going on at Area 51, where at least the, uh, the ufologists could go up there in some mountaintop and look at it from 10 or 15 miles away. This one literally could not be looked at from any direction where you, didn't, where you weren't trespassing on federal property at Nellis Range. In fact, the, the concern for security in the mid-'80s was so severe there that one of the uh, generals that I dealt with through EG&G asked me, what's the wildest idea I could dream of, of for doing a, a perimeter security monitoring system that could look out 10 and 15 miles without fail pick up an intruder? And it was a funny one because I came up with a synthetic boulder that had a self-powering system in it where we had special cameras hooked to telescopes where we literally could monitor a jackrabbit at 10 kilometers in a moonless night and reliably catch him in the camera and actually take a picture up, monitor him. And that was tied in with even some suggestions of how to have harmless roving guards out there on horseback. But they would actually work for another department of the government. And this was, these suggestions were taken very seriously. And when it comes to the point of creating artificial boulders and taking a suggestion like that very seriously, with a lot of very complex electronics putting these boulders, and the boulders, of course, placed on strategic cliffs up on the hills looking outwards away from the base, and then linking them by underground fiber or by uh, microwave, hidden microwave transmitters, back to a war room at the base, you do not spend that type of money on that type of technology unless you're planning a long-term program there. This, the military does not waste money like that, in spite of the $65,000 toilet seats. Did, did you get indications then that this and other facilities had uh, UFO-related hardware or projects? The indication was that what was in these underground facilities prior to my, the staff that I would have sent in from do, to do the work, they would remove it. There was indications from, you can look at scuff marks on the floor, you can look at a lot of where usage is on equipment, that there was equipment in these facilities and they had removed it from my men to go in and do the work. And EG&G has a history of a deep knowledge and control of everything in Southern Nevada. Uh, it's, it's common knowledge. They used to control and still monitor the test site itself. They also have the, own the contract airline that takes the employees every morning, brings them back every night to Papoose, to Area 51, and to Tonopah. So it's not an unusual environment we're dealing with here. We could almost call that EG&G's backyard and the history of the, of the company was from the nuclear testing phases during World War II and the initial testing afterwards. It was a science company meant to do work for the government offline, away from FOIAs, which is the, uh, one of the greatest concerns I have is that if we really want to find out what's going on out there, legitimately or illegitimately in the black project arena, we need to modify, if we can get it through Congress and the President, we need to modify the FOIA regulations to have no loopholes 
and to require that all government contractors, even black, are required to submit information through the FOIA system. Because right now, it is a, it's, a, it's a sieve. It's a giant back door for them to purposely ignore the requests of either Congress or the public. What do you say to people who contend, and, and I encounter this a great deal in uh, scientific and media circles, that we can't keep secrets like this, that if there is anything to these <coughs> electrogravitic craft and UFOs that uh, everyone would know about it, the secrets simply have not been able to be maintained and aren't maintained anymore. The ability of our government to keep secrets is actually has a long history of being very valid. There's a lot of programs that were successfully kept quiet for decades, if not close to half a century. And, uh, and during the last 10 years, we've seen a lot of announcements of programs that were kept very secret by our government. Um, example is the, um, the syphilis study, and I believe it was um, Alabama, back in the 30s. Nobody knew what really went on until the, uh, I think it was the late 80s, early 90s, when that program was released. And the fact that the Japanese had a biological warfare detachment working in Mongolia, who we agreed not to punish, even though they killed thousands, hundreds of our own soldiers that were POWs, simply so we could get our hands on the records, the results of their testing. That program wasn't released, and I, I believe the full story of that didn't come out until the 90s, early 90s. So that's a close to a 50-year period where they kept that large project secret and uh, were able to continue the research at Fort Detrick and other places on a biological experimentation on our own people. So the ability of our government to keep secrets if the people truly believe in what they're working on is possible. In fact, more than possible. They can generally succeed. What concerns me is when the projects go beyond black and that we have failure with people with ulterior motives that have gotten in control of these projects and or the funding for them and or the ability of what really is scary is to write their own checks, unlimited checks with no recourse to anybody. They're not even in a budget item anymore. They literally authorize the Treasury to cut them checks. And this is where we need to have an audit, if you want to call it that, made on all these projects and a responsible committee start monitoring the flow of black money. Do you think this is just restricted to the U.S., or do you see that it's, it has international scope? Oh, I would say this is international in scope. The projects that we have are closely tied in with other allies' governments. In fact, I had been told back in the late 70s on one of the early classified projects I worked on, once I got my security clearance back, was that there is a secret agreement between us and the Brits that whatever we invent, they get. Whatever they invent, we get. And there is no limitation as to what it is. If our boomers look like whatever they look like, the, the Brits can make them duplicates. And we don't hold back on any of the technology because of that secret agreement that was cut during World War II. And we have other allies like that. And I believe that what we also see is we see a lot of cross-pollination of scientists from different countries working on projects even in the most classified arenas in the United States. I ran into these people repeatedly. The um, uh, group that is, is running a lot of covert projects, what do you see as the agenda? And what agendas are operating? Uh, what, what have you come across by piecing together some of these experiences you had as a consultant in security? And I believe my, I would believe, Steve, that my initial view on what were the, the agendas were behind various black projects back in the 70s and early 80s, when I first became really aware of what was going on, above and beyond my own political attitudes on how the really world really turned, was one of still of a good basis. They were looking to defend the United States. They were looking to protect the free world. But if you get into the situation more and more, it becomes evident that they have agendas that are independent of the, the goals of the United States. 
and that the attitudes seem to be one of control, power and control. And it's, in a, it's I guess you could call that almost the second oldest profession in the world. Do you, uh, you mentioned this uh, dreadful incident in Nairobi with the, the man that was yes. apparently killed. Uh, do you, have you seen other ev <coughs> evidence of lethal force being used to maintain secrecy? On Not as close as that event. But do you think it has been used? Oh that? yes, absolutely. Where necessary, it's used. Probably need to incorporate my question in your answer. So it's... The ability of certain forces out there, Steve, to use force when absolutely necessary or other controlling mechanisms to ameliorate the danger of a leak, to control those or maintain secrecy or fear is always there. Uh, what happened to Bob in, Ken in Nairobi is a situation where I felt that they decided that he was getting too close and he wasn't afraid and he was too powerful and they had to take him out and they take him out in a normal way. Not unlike the strange events with um, Representative Schiff here in New Mexico who almost never went in the sun because he was living indoors just about all his life as a representative in Congress and yet he magically got an aggressive cancer. There are ways to, to attack that problem. I've talked to some people that were previously SEALs who went on some rather strange missions. And I've talked to some mercs, because we run across those types once in a while, who have been assigned or tasked with taking out people or affecting situations in such a way that they're using it as a control mechanism. And these people, because they are duty bound, will literally take orders and do whatever they're told. That good Nazi philosophy. That's right. So do you think that, the, for example, a biological problems such as cancer could be uh, induced or used uh, to intimidate or to take someone out of the picture? One of the, Steve, one of the problems you have in that arena is that it's kept very close to the vest. And when somebody on the, that's only on the periphery is looking at those control factors used to manipulate people, you get the flavor of it. I have not been close enough to actually taste it. I don't know if I want to. But what you have to look at is the psychological factors involved, that if they can do one whole pro, high profile hit on somebody in a specific way. What it does, it puts the fear of God into those that they want to continue to control so that they don't say anything out of tune. They don't probe where they shouldn't probe like Senator Schiff was doing, Congressman Schiff was doing. Um, we've seen in the last 10 years a ramping up though, if one does even the most cursory research. Uh, one of the ones that concerned me the most was the um, death of our Commerce Secretary several years ago on a mountaintop in Yugoslavia where the hostess, the Air Force hostess on the plane survived because she was sitting on the jump seat in the back and a certain British group went in there first and she was alive and healthy when she left the mountain and she got down to the airport she was dead and she only had minor bruises and Somebody needs to look into the influence that certain British commando units have and their cross-pollination with other groups like them in the United States. But what was even stranger was that his body made it back to Dover Air Force Base, Senator Brown. Uh, I'm sorry, Secretary Brown. And they discovered that there was a bullet wound in the top of the head about the diameter of a 45 and that a preliminary x-ray indicated that there were shavings of some sort inside the, the brain itself. And that yet he was raced out of that or into a crematorium literally within a day so nobody could do an auto a serious autopsy. And the people at Dover in the Air Force Base there were severely chastised for even doing what they did voluntarily. But in the profession, there is a way of doing this with frozen CO2 bullets or nitrogen bullets 
and the, uh, there is no residue left except what the shattered pieces of the skull cavity. And this is of grave concern to a lot of us because this seems to be an ongoing process, particularly in the last 10 years. It's become very blatant across the entire spectrum of our government, nationally and internationally. And I think we all can just follow the web tracks these days as to where this, the implications are for that. And the need for continuing control are getting more severe. And the, the use of these mechanisms becoming ever more blatant. Well, so where do you think this is headed? I mean, what are, you, what are your concerns about where we're headed? What's My concerns are for the freedom of our country and of the free world. It sounds rather simplistic. But we have to have a philosophy upon which we base our lives. And my philosophy is that the Republican form of government, if we can get back to it in some way, shape, or form, is the strongest form of government ever developed by man by basically allowing one event to occur. And that is that we allow everybody to become a sovereign individual. It's been proven in the last 200 some years, particularly from the technological development we've experienced since the founding of this country that to a great extent has been focused first in the United States that is the most motivating type of mechanism we can possibly have for our species to advance and yet there seem to be countervailing forces trying to stop it and if we uh, don't find ways to neutralize these negative forces we're going to find our lifestyles our concepts of life as a species nullified uh, you've mentioned over the course of this interview a few parts. Which agents do you think are, are heavily involved in this whole effort, agencies and corporations? Uh, if, Steve, if you look at what layers of influence we have here, either at government or corporate level, I would say that at the corporate level we have to look primarily first. If you're talking about new propulsion technologies, we would first only look to the aerospace industry. I've had deep discussions with some people over a long period of time who either they or their fathers had worked for various aerospace companies and had been directly involved with the research as far back as the early 50s on into the 60s and then by the 70s they felt they had overcome most of the problems in reverse engineering technologies from what, interestingly enough, they do never call UFOs, but they call AVCs. What does that stand for? Alien Visitation Craft. And that means they know who they are. It's just the question is, what's the color of their skin? If you want to use a generic term. But that these firms, and you can name them, they're all the top five in the nation. They're all involved in it, in one degree or another. And they have their black within black. In fact, I wouldn't be surprised if we don't find another few years that a lot of these firms have company uh, divisions that are even darker than the Skunk Works. And that that one was almost a front for primary work in deeper divisions. And we have other divisions of the government. It, there was so much in the way of how long did the NRO la run before anybody even knew they are operational. And then we get to the point where they're building their own headquarters in Virginia for almost $800 million, I believe. And nobody even knew they were spending the money on their new giant headquarters, which would have actually been larger almost than the headquarters for the CIA. So we have a situation here where somebody is not doing due diligence at the public level and at the government level in monitoring what's going on. You know, would you invest in a company without researching it properly to see if your investment is well placed? Well, we have people in, our, in the public and in our government that are simply not doing due diligence and upholding their oath of office for finding out what's really going on with our own government. Well, what, then that brings to another question. Uh, what about the fourth estate and the media? Um, you would think that they would want to investigate <coughs> these issues seriously instead of just ridiculing them. The subject, Steve, of the media, from my viewpoint only, it's a personal viewpoint, okay. because I'm not intimately involved with the media on a day-to-day -day basis like some of the other people you've interviewed, as one of having been in to a degree and looking at the outside 
and seeing it as a total manipulative process with the media. They have their own agenda, and it's very liberal. We know which way they would generally vote if you did a Gallup poll on the media. We have an alternate media that is much closer to the truth, particularly on the web these days, but is purposely ignored. Anything of a serious nature is laughed at or, or neutralized as much as possible. A perfect example is the recent elections in this year of ours, 2000, where we have legitimately four or five people running for president and they would never even have the debates cover other than the main two largest parties. That's a control mechanism that's rather blatant. If the people were really given a fair shake as to what's going on, we would have had all of the presidential contenders at each of those events on TV. I believe there were three of them. And we would have equal time in the newspapers and in time in the weekly news journals. So from the most mundane to the obvious, inobvious, it's obvious that the media is manipulated heavily. And I, wouldn't hate, I would hate to be a White House correspondent and say something against the president and find the next week my credentials are yanked. So you just have that happen once, and everybody there knows the limits to which they can go. But this is now happening throughout our system, not just in the government, in corporate reporting too. CNBC is a prime example of only saying nice things about corporations to keep their stock up, and hence keep the cash flow going into the advertising dollars going to CNBC. It's a bottom line problem. What do you? Um, I, w I wanted to ask a question about this uh, event near Pope Air Force Base. Going back to the first yes. Uh, wh wh how large and what shape was this object? The object, when it first appeared, appeared as a white flat disc. And what was strange about it was the whitest white I had ever seen. Either of us had seen. At its closest point, it was 300 feet up and about 50 feet straight line up from us over a tree line of pine trees away from the lake. And it was a perfectly flat white disk of pure even white light. You could sense there was a body above it, a, a round structure. The diameter was in that 35, maybe 40 foot range. And it did not wobble, it was dead steady, and it was running into, moving along, almost coasting, like you would skip up something against smooth water. Just like, it was running on glass totally silent, and it went at about 25, 30 miles an hour. It was almost like it was a tourist, just watching the pretty lake we were at. And, but it has an effect that we, we looked at our watches at when it happened, and we looked at again when it left. So we know there was no missing time, yet it had an effect that we were unaware of on all the wildlife around us. And obviously they have an ability to sense something that we as homo sapiens have no ability to sense. And it, it bothered them enough that they went quiet. And it was eerie because in the south in the summer, with the high humidity, sound travels for a mile or two. And you get a bullfrog growing, you can hear them a mile or two away easily. And what was interesting was that the sound within earshot went silent, not just in the immediate area. And there are other old sand lakes. This was one of those old sand quarries been turned into a recreational lake. And what interested me most was the fact that what effect this had on the wildlife was able to penetrate out beyond our ability to pick up the sound, which meant a mile or two away. So as it moved along, it was had a as an effect on the, the insect life and whatnot that moved with it. Anything else you'd like to share? Not at this time. That's your experiences? Not at this time. Good. Well, it's great timing. We're right at the one hour mark. And I've got a few seconds left. That's why I was asking you. You'll probably see this flashing. Yep. Yeah. But it's still recording. Um, the, the gentleman you worked with uh, at first in Denver from Hughes and, and Mark Marietta, uh, did they have any information or knowledge about the UFO no. reverse engineering? No. That was primarily intelligence data. They were working on spy satellites okay. uh, at one, in one aspect, and the other one was working on the electronics for receiving the spy data. Okay. And um, 
that was their specialty. And we just used them. They were brought in because of their high-end electronics knowledge. Very good. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, Steve.